Hi everyone. We are still talking about um, viruses and I'm in section 5.2 general structure of viruses. So I'm going to go down the the objectives on your lecture study guide. And the first one says, discuss the size of viruses relative to other microorganisms. I'm looking over there because I'm looking at my paper where the objectives are written. So we're at objective, it says number five, discuss the size of viruses relative to other microorganisms. And this whole paragraph is actually pretty interesting. So I'm in your textbook. I just thought for this lecture that the um, the textbook did it just the way I would have done it. So um, here it says, as a group, viruses represent the smallest infectious agents. Remember that they are um, they are filterable. You are going to learn, and, and you know, filterable means they were smaller than bacteria. Um, it says, with some unusual exceptions, which we will talk about in video on section 5.5. Um, but they're saying. Um, more than 2,000 bacterial viruses could fit inside the average bacterial cell. And 50 million polioviruses could fit inside a human cell. So viruses are quite small. And it talks a little bit more here about that. Look at this picture in your textbook. And what it's showing you is this is a yeast cell. And it's saying that it's about 7 micrometers. And um, a yeast cell is a eukaryotic cell, just like our own cells. So it's along the size of human cells. Here's a little bud. This is a little baby coming off the yeast cell. And um, comparing that to E. coli and um, you know a typical bacteria size. You might remember we were talking about bacteria might be about 1 micrometer across. And there's a Streptococcus bacterium about one micrometer across. And so what they're showing you here uh, is uh, all the variation in virus size. And you can see some of these get incredibly, oh, that's a hemoglobin molecule, actually. But the yellow fever virus is quite small, about 22 nanometers. So you can see virus size is substantially smaller than bacterial size or eukaryotic cell size. And we typically don't see viruses um, using our light microscopes, the kind we would use in most teaching and research labs. Here's them showing you some of them on electron microscopes. Um, the next objective says describe the function and structures of viral capsids. Um, and I would just, instead of saying viral capsids, I might change that to describe the structure and function of, um, of the the, the anatomy of the virus, you know, instead of the viral capsid, because the capsid is just a part of it. Let's see. So here we go. Um, viruses bear no real resemblance to cells. They do not have protein synthesizing machinery. And um, they're remember, they're non-living. They're acellular. They don't have cells. So they're completely different. And it's interesting to hear the discussions when people are saying, are they... Um, very simple living things are complex molecules and um, whatever you say they are they're they're definitely unique from all other um, infectious agents and so when you look at a virus this is a great picture to start on figure 5.3 um, that all viruses have a protein capsid or a shell that surrounds a nucleic acid core so if we look at this it's showing you this this outer part that's kind of um, it's actually called an icosahedron, but um, you can see this geometric shape on the outside. It's a hollow ball of protein. And you can see all these little subunits of the protein are called caps, are, well, they're called capsomeres, but the whole thing, this whole protein ball is called a capsid. So we've got this protein ball and inside is the DNA or the RNA. Remember we talked about viruses having DNA or RNA, but not both, and that's the nucleic acid. So we've got this hollow ball of protein, um, and obviously you need nucleic acid to have the instructions on how to make more viruses. And this protein ball, this capsid, is there to protect that nucleic acid and um, just help it survive in the environment. The and other parts of the vir of a virus, and when we, we talk about one particle of virus, we call it a virion. So this is a picture of a virion. And you'll notice here it says there's a naked virion and there's an envelope or a naked virus and an enveloped virus. 
and um, one unit of the virus is a virion. So let's look at the difference. Here's our enveloped virus. There's our nucleic acid. It also has a capsid. They just drew it a little bit differently. Um, it's got that hollow ball with the nucleic acid inside. This one has another outer layer that we're going to call the envelope. And the envelope is actually, it's, it's a phospholipid bilayer that's just like a plasma membrane. And the reason is because when um, that virus is inside of a host cell, when it goes to leave the host cell, it takes a little bit of the host's plasma membrane and surrounds itself. And so you can imagine that the envelope kind of hide, helps hide the virus from the immune system. It makes it um, look a little bit like the host cells. So an envelope virus, and most animal viruses are envelope viruses, have this envelope, this phospholipid bilayer around the outside of the capsid. A naked virus does not have an envelope. Both the naked virus and the envelope virus may or may not have an additional set of proteins called spikes. And what these spikes can do, you can see they're really easy to pick out here. What the spikes, they, they do a couple different things, but one of the things that spikes do is that they, um, they recognize places to attach on the host cells. So they're kind of like matching up with certain proteins on the host cells. So um, if it's if this is a oh well like a coronavirus, the coronavirus is actually an enveloped um, virus with spikes. Um, it attaches to cells in our respiratory tract, and so these spikes are going to recognize certain proteins that are on our cells in our respiratory tract and attach to them. Coronaviruses don't infect your skin because they don't um, recognize skin proteins. They, they only attach to the um, respiratory cells. So that's a generalized structure of viruses. Um, and here's that there actually are um, three major shapes of capsids. Well, it says two, helical, helical and icosahedral. You might hear that called polyhedral. Um, helical and icosahedral, and there's one variation on that. So here's some pictures in your book. If the capsid, so notice these two have a capsid that's about the same shape. It's that has these triangular sides. A helical virus is actually got a capsid that's elongated. And so here's a picture, uh, electron microscope picture of a tobacco mosaic virus. And you can see it looks really long. So that's like a hollow tube. And inside is the nucleic acid for that causes tobacco mosaic um, disease. And so we call these long, um, long viruses that have a long capsid. We call that helical. They can, it can be naked. So it can be without an envelope, and you can see that doesn't have any spikes. Um, or it could have an envelope. Now, if you're an envelope, enveloped virus, the helical virus in this case is kind of curled up, and the virus itself looks kind of circular because the envelope's kind of folded that helical virus in there. But the capsid itself is elongated, so we call that a helical virus. So another shape of a capsid is in the ones I showed you in the in the introduction there, it's called an icosahedron or an icosahedral virus. And what it has is the capsid has 20 triangular sides. And you can kind of see that in this diagram a little bit better. See how the sides are like triangles? And so this capsid is an icosahedral capsid. This one is two, and it's got 20 triangular sides. There's another picture of it. This one is a spiked naked icosahedral virus. And so when we were talking about um, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, how do they group them together? One of the things they do look, is it a helical virus? Is it icosahedral? Is it um, naked or is it enveloped? And that can help them group them together. There's, I told you there'd be one other um, group to look at or one other shape. And these are called complex viruses. And the complex viruses are only found, have only been found to infect bacteria. And look at this virus. This is uh, complex, meaning it's got more than one shape. So right here, there's 
a portion of it that has a, um, a cosahedral portion. And you see the nucleic acids inside there. But then it's got all these other parts. And I always think it would be so cool. Now remember, these are really small, so you can only see them with an electron microscope. Um, but I can only imagine what it was like the first time people saw these under the microscope, thinking they were, they look like little Martians, something from outer space. But these are really common viruses that infect um, bacteria, and they're called complex viruses because they have some of these, you know, familiar shapes, but they've got all these other really cool parts. And so this virus actually sits down on the surface of a bacterial cell. It's going to recognize the bacterial cell proteins, and it's going to inject the DNA into the bacterial cell. We call those complex viruses. Um, I think I explained the importance of the spikes, number nine, and I just wanted to mention the nucleic acid configurations. Remember we talked about uh, the, the DNA or the RNAs inside of the viral capsid, and um, we call that the genetic material, it's, its genome. Remember that the nucleic acid is DNA or RNA. Remember, our cells have DNA to RNA to proteins, while viruses have DNA or RNA, but not both. And this is going to become important when we talk a little bit more about um, vaccines and um, to be, well, to be determined, to be talked about a little bit more later in the semester. Um, and also remember that nucleic acid, the DNA can be single-stranded or double-stranded, and um, RNA can be single-stranded or double-stranded, double-stranded or single-stranded. So there's a lot of variation in viruses and how they're put together. Here are some examples of, um, you know, double-stranded DNA virus, smallpox virus, um, herpes virus. Single-stranded DNA parvovirus causes uh, certain dog diseases and other infections. So um, single-stranded RNA virus, double-stranded RNA virus. So all sorts of things going on with, with DNA and RNA. And at that point, I think, oh, I just want to show you this picture. This picture is just a like a human cell. Here's a human cell. And here's some viruses popping out of that cell. And what they're doing is they're picking off their inside and then they'll pick off a little bit of that plasma membrane. They'll surround themselves with it as they leave and they leave as enveloped viruses. So there you go. I'm going to stop there.